Dylan. This is um, a presentation on masculinity in society. I am a transgender woman. I also identify as Asperger's or non-binary trans feminine. Class is a huge issue. If we think about uh, the way masculinity looks in working class circles versus uh, more affluent or poor circles, those are all factors that play a role in so many men playing from the clothes that they buy to the politics that they share. Race is a huge issue. People are viewed differently in society based upon um, race. So race is an issue as well. Disability. I know that as someone who is disabled and assigned male at birth, that as a disabled person, I'm viewed a little differently as somebody who's transgender and disabled. I was assigned male at birth. I went through the system as a male, and there are differences between male disabled people and people on the feminine side of the spectrum as well. Public health. There's a lot of public health issues going into masculinity. Think of the war on drugs or the fatality. Healthcare. Within the queer community, there's a whole issue of um, healthcare. We think about T for trans men, testosterone, um, uh, hormone replacement therapy for people with masculine side spectrum, and we also think about PrEP for um, PrEP for people who identify as gay. Those are um, example of healthcare issues. Let's start with gender identity. Let's start with gender. The first issue is um. Gender identity. Now, gender identity is um, the way somebody identifies uh, is who a person is in their head. So, um, your body is considered to be your sex, and your your mind is your gender. Um, there was this a time when people thought that sex equals gender, but now we know that that's false. That gender is a wide spectrum, and sex is something that is assigned at birth. That a doctor assigns at birth based upon the genitals a person has. Um, a person's gender identity varies. Um, on one side we have, uh, of masculinity, we have cisgendered males, people who are assigned male at birth and identify that way, non-binary masculine, people who are um, assigned <laughs> female at birth, but identifying the masculine side of the spectrum but not necessarily as what people would think of as a cisgender male. Uh, there are people who are trans men who were assigned female at birth, but who identify um, as men. Gender expression. Now, as I said before, somebody's gender identity is not necessarily based upon how they appear. For instance, at one point, um, I had a full beard. Now, that doesn't mean, so my gender expression, people thought of as masculine, but in my head, I didn't identify, I don't identify with masculinity at all. Um, 
we think about this also is an issue um, because, for instance, we think about tomboys, people who are assigned female at birth, but like to dress, sometimes act, wear their hair in a masculine way. Um, short hair, things of that nature. When I was presenting as male, I had long hair. Um, just because somebody is presenting, their gender expression is long hair. That doesn't mean they don't identify as male. Um, passing. Passing is a huge issue. So, based upon somebody's gender expression, uh, there is a idea of society in turn says based upon your gender expression you fit into what we normally think of as this. For instance, if you're a person with long hair, people might assume from the bath or even from the front if the person is quite shaven that they are a um, a uh, female, but they might identify as male. This is also an issue on the flip side. If somebody is um, a transgender, they might not pass as the gender of which they identify. So when people see them, they see their birth sex. Um, and that is a huge issue of safety and things of that nature. Gender dysphoria. Gender dysphoria is um, a clinical diagnosis where somebody is gender identity um, or somebody experiences a incongruence either socially, physically, or um, uh, an incongruence with the gender of which they were sent at birth and the distress that it can cause. So in my case, the, so for somebody who's trans masculine, they progress during their first puberty, which is considered to be a feminine characteristic, a feminine secondary sex characteristic. But a man, but they identify as male. So when they wake up and see their breasts on a day to day basis, it causes them immense distress and physical pain as a constant reminder of who society says that they are. And they don't identify with their breasts at all, oftentimes. Although I want to emphasize that not. Every trans person's transition is different. Some people get surgery, some people don't. Some people take hormones, and others don't. But that is a very common issue that we find. So, sex. A person's sex is considered to be what their body is, okay? Uh, their body uh, physically is a physical sex. Um, also, some people also say uh, genitals are a huge part um, assigned at birth. So we say in the trans community, in the queer community, that we say, well, okay, I was assigned male at birth because the doctor saw a penis so the doctor equates this body as a male body. That doesn't have anything to do with the person's identity but that doesn't mean they identify as male but that just means that that's the body. Um, however, this is not a binary thing. 
either. There's also intersex. Intersex is um, an issue where is um, intersex people um, have a mixture of sex, secondary, primary sex characteristics um, <laughs> of a different that are associated with different genders. So there are people born with vaginas, but might have testicles. There are people who are who are assigned one thing, but might go through a different type of puberty than people might expect, and so on and so forth. Sexuality. Sexuality is a huge issue. As far as I'm concerned, sexuality and gender are very intertwined with one another. Link, so to speak. So I first want to talk about the split attraction model. Somebody, there are different types of attraction. Who you might like looking at is not who you want, who you might to date and who you might want to date may not be the kind of person that you want to actually have sex with or engage in sexual activities in various forms. Um, for instance, my teenage crush was Janis Joplin. Now, I am asexual, but I found her attractive. So, didn't want to have sex with her, but I thought she was pretty good. And then there's um, romantic attraction. Again, when attraction out, who do you want to date? Um, who you want to date is different. So, who you want to date is, uh, that would be your romantic attraction. Some people experience romantic attraction, and some people don't. Some people are aromantic, and some people what you would probably call alloromantic. It all depends on the person. Just because somebody's asexual doesn't mean they're aromantic. Um, there's also uh, sexual attraction, where somebody's um, where somebody is attracted to engaging in sexual activities with a person. Um, there's also um, plutonic attraction. Uh, we sometimes call in the ace community, we call them squishes, friend crushes, where a person wants to get to know and build a social connection, but doesn't necessarily want to be intimate in any way, but may want to be with this person, hence what we then call a queer platonic partnership. Um, where they might not be romantically involved, but they might be very close friends to the point where they might want to raise a child together. Um, orientation. Uh, aesthetic attraction. That's who a person may like to look at. Hence, um, person's orientation. Just because, so in my case, I like looking at boys, and I like looking at girls. I am bi. But, although I find both boys and girls attractive, I don't want to, I'm not attracted to having sex with them. I'm attracted to getting to know them, possibly dating them, and by romantic. Although some people, you could be you could find both boys and girls attractive. You can be, or you could be um, attracted to one gender or another, or you could be what's called um, pan, uh, have a, what's called pansexual orientation, where you could be attracted to anyone, 
based upon no matter their gender identity, and which includes non-binary and trans. Uh, okay. Gender expression is also a factor in this, because somebody's gender expression, we think about it, also can be influenced by feminine sexuality. For instance, there are gay men who wear makeup. Uh, there are women who dress like boys and present that way. Who dread and in general, people's gender expressions are variable. In a general context, where people dress in some, sometimes people dress based upon who they're trying to, to who they're trying to attack, and who they're not trying to attract. A person might dress differently if they're trying to attract a boy than if they're trying to attract a male. If in the queer community, um, if you are attracted um, to, you know, all genders, all sexuality, you know, you might go about your gender expression in a different way. This is also an issue um, within masculinity. When I was um, presenting as male, there was always this idea that a person should express themselves and their masculinity through what they wear. If we think of like suits being masculine um, and dresses being feminine, although there are boys who were dresses and girls who wear um, rare suits. And that doesn't necessarily mean that a person is transgender. Another issue is that which falls into gender expression is um, an issue of sexuality. So there are gay men, trans, there are gay men who, and all different types of men all across the masculine spectrum, gay men, primarily gay men, although I have heard stories of straight men doing this too, but this is synonymous with Gay men. gay men who are um, there are gay men who are um, who find it attractive to express a feminine presentation while still identifying as men for sake of entertainment. Hence we would call them drag kings. At the same token I mean, drag queens. We would call them drag queens. We would call people who identify as female and, again, want to present a masculine image uh, for sake of entertainment. We would call that um, drag kings. And oftentimes, these are people who identify as gay girls. Uh, heteronormativity. Heteronormativity is a huge issue. We think of, so in masculinity, we think of um, heteronormativity as your, the essence of your manhood is we talked about this all the time growing up, I heard stories from the boys I was hanging around with, of 
it's a prime, oh, the essence of your manhood, a reflection of your manhood is how many women a person might have had sex with. That's sometimes talked about amongst um, straight men, although not all straight men are like that, but that's an issue. And um, in so doing, there's a lot of pride relating to that. Okay. And that in and of itself is the sort of heteronormative standard. However, a person can be masculine and really identify as a masculine man, but be into other men. Hence, we would call the seven individual, we would call them gay. Gay men. Um, but as society, we portray and we idealize heterosexual, heteroromantic, monogamous relationships. Um, where between somebody who is assigned male at birth and female. Um, and because of that, that creates a normative standard to people who are outside of that, hence minorities in that context, would be left out and by and have a sense of what we like to call erasure for um, feeling bad about who they are and they're being, from their point of view, they're being shown that their identity is bad or undesirable or invalid. Okay. Polyamory. Uh, polyamory is where somebody consensually is in a relationship with more than one person. This is slightly different from an open relationship, but um, in a polyamorous relationship, there's a uh, mutual agreement between all parties involved that they can either um, date, have sex with, or date or have sex with, really, is the um, or be together with other people as well as them. So, for instance, somebody could be in a relationship with one person and want to spend the night with another person, but as long as it's agreed, agreed upon with the with the person that they're um, dating, then they are allowed to have as many partners as they want. Hence, opposite to that, it's called a monogamous relationship, where somebody is just in a relationship with one person and committed to one person. Um, so that is uh, an issue as well. Uh, because again, I don't know what to be, we idealize a heteronormative opposite sex with one another relationship. Even though the world is far more diverse than that. Next issue that I want to bring up which is factor in this is T or as most people call outside of the queer community, testosterone. Now this is a huge issue because the male sexual arousal system, sexual, it can be very difficult for somebody to come out as age because if you think about it, there's this idea among cis men, hetero cis men, that again, this idea of idealizing the sexual activities of manhood. Now, when the testosterone is making you um, have this sex drive, that can lead to issues. So like for me, as an asexual person, I always felt like a slave to tea because the testosterone was giving me sexual arousal, which made me feel dysphoric because I don't identify as male, but also 
it made me feel. But also, I was in a situation where, although I'm asexual, I had to deal with that in the context of my relationships with other people. And every so often, I had a little Jiminy Cricket in my head saying, you know, you must have sex with this person and in turn they would be harmed physically if I didn't handle those masculine issues. And that's an issue because society says that for those people who are not sexual, that there's something wrong with that. Um, hence the idea of allo normativity. We live in a very sexualized society. So people who are asexual, and the opposite is allosexual, is um, an issue. We also see this in the queer community. There are a lot of people in the queer community who don't consider asexuality, aromanticism, to be a part of the queer community. I personally say that it is. And that's because, from what I can tell, that we've idealized sex to the point where, although people who have experienced sexual attraction, they have grand society, and people who, you know, is very telling, it people have said, well, okay, you know, this is who you can and can have sex with. And then when people say, well, wait a minute, we all just wanted to have sex with whoever we wanted, and now you're coming along and saying you don't experience sexual attraction. Well, then that's not really a part of us, because what makes us queer is who we're attracted to. In our case, what makes us queer is who, what we're attracted to doing. Okay, the next issue I want to discuss is race. Let's talk about passing again. Um, if we think about historically, where oftentimes in some circles, some people feel like they have to pass as something else, or whatever the majority is. So, in the case of, uh, let's take uh, Jimi Hendrix, for example. Jimi Hendrix had a fan base that was mostly white. He was black. And he had to put he had to, he felt like he was passing in a white culture. And so, for that reason, he, and so doing that, um, in a, um, a black culture we think about this today um, in certain workplaces, for example. People may feel like they have to culturally pass as whatever the dominant culture is. So it's race, not think about, um, you know, blacks going into a workplace. Think about from it from that perspective. Another perspective is when we think about dealing with police, Sometimes um, black, uh, black men feel like they have to um, acknowledge themselves and present themselves in a certain way just to pass as not the stereotype or not they're doing wrong. Um, 
tokenization. This is an issue for many minorities, but it's also an issue of race. I was watching a Christmas movie, for instance, and there was a token. The only black person in the movie was a guitar player who was sitting in. So that's an issue as well. Um, you know, but, and then if anyone else would be like, well, yes, we have a black person in our film, hence they would be the token. But really, nobody cares about the people who made the film, doesn't care about this actor, just having a person there because it's convenient or because it's politically correct. Happens with a lot of minorities, but race as well. Media. I've spent a lot of time in the suburbs, and people in the suburbs feel like they're afraid to go into a neighborhood sometimes. Now, I think part of that is because of the media and the portrayal of crime in working class and poor neighborhoods. So that's an issue as well. Um, racism, of course. Um, you know, that's a huge issue in this country as well. Um, gentrification. So when the working class... So in... When neighborhoods get better, richer people come living in, the poor people and oftentimes our neighborhoods are kicked out and they have nowhere to live and the rent has gone up. Hence their neighborhood is being gentrified. That's an issue as well. Um another issue is class. Class is a huge issue as well. We think of um, poverty. People oftentimes think it's synonymous with blacks, but in reality, we have a whole um, uh, white working class, which some might argue we've neglected throughout our history. Um, and a huge issue, and culturally, they, uh, one of the things that have really helped that and caused a lot of issues with race is labor unions, uh, a union union. So, historically, there were issues of, well, they have, there were, historically there were issues of, um, people who were identifying um, there were issues of black communions, things of that nature. It was an issue in the teaching union, things of that nature. It's one of the criticisms, although that is not true. Anyone can join the union, do, but historically that was an issue. Okay. Um, because of this, because of the left recent year paying more attention to the needs of the black community, a lot of people in the white world not feel very marginalized and left out. And um, feel very marginalized because of that, which has led to um, depression limits. So that means that when two minorities are competing over who is the most oppressed, um, and the reason why this is an issue in the community is um, an issue of who is the most oppressed. Um, there are people, uh, and what happens is uh, what oppressed what people say, well, if you're not handling their oppression, I'll just get behind down in front. Um, so, next issue is nativism. One of the issues with class and the white working class and men is our uh, 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 
Native in there, where there's this ever since the sun hitting me up in the front. Very cynical. Like, they're keeping something from us as working class people. Get the other, get them out of here, that's in that place. That's the mentality of an idiot. Now, uh, another issue when it comes to poverty is uh, pride. A lot of people who, a um, lot of white working class men who can't, uh, who have trouble feeding their families, feel a sense of pride because history, historically, they say, like, oh, the man is supposed to be good in there. And a person feels like they have not lived up to their expectations of their man. Urban. So we think of urban white working class as uh, places like Bensonhurst, Regal Park, uh, Garrison Beach, um, Sheep's Head Bay, places like that. We think of rural working class and poor as uh, places like Oneonta, Binghamton, Schenectady, um, and places like Troy, um, Franklin, and uh, places like that. And uh, another issue of um, within rural is uh, what you see is, um, for instance, in SUNY uh, Oneonta, there are people who, the people who are born and raised in Oneonta don't go to SUNY Oneonta. And most of the people who, who fly these college towns are people from out of town who go to school. Another issue is benefits. And this goes into organization as well. There's this idea of the benefits are complex. Well, you know, and, and then um, and then it's but and then there's this issue of somebody who's white can't be poor. Well you know, and it can be kind of awkward. When you walk, I've walked into, uh, say, the Jamaica Social Security office, and nobody in there looks like me, and yet it's, I, and yet, um, in places, or uh, in rural places, most of the people on benefits are white. So it's a very interesting mixed dichotomy of things of that nature. And this is used as a wedge issue. Something, a wedge issue, basically something used to, a wedge issue is something used to get someone from, uh, get someone to vote for you, uh, just because it it's an issue that matters to the base, but not necessarily in reality. Um, it's an issue that's used for political gain just to draw up the base. The issue might be important, it might not be important, but it may not necessarily be important in reality or not, but its primary purpose is to just use it, get the base out. Get the And this is an issue when there's this idea of benefits being relaxed. Uh, people are always say, well, and the right one says, well, you see, there's, there's these um, lots of mutual out to your jobs, things of that nature. And then it's like, well, and, and then they say, well, oh, that's for them. There's nothing for us. Hence, we are going to um, uh, vote. Um, for the right way. Respectability politics. 
Respectability politics is a huge issue as well. There's this idea that somebody is more respectable if they've hit a preconceived norm. So, for instance, back to that example of um, a working class guy in my table, I'm I have a job. I I don't want to pay for. I'm much more respectable because I, I have a job. I earn this money, and why should I have to pay for this poor person? Okay. Another issue is disability. Disability is a huge issue as well. The first issue is uh, self-determination. Self-determination is a huge issue because um, it is a huge issue because, and back to again to the issue of masculinity. For somebody who's assigned male at birth, they feel like society says they have to be a provider, but if they're uh, disabled, they feel like, well, my self determination is questioned. So there was this push to have disabled people be the essence of their own rights um, and be able to um, control their own life services. That's why we have the Homestead decision, which um, is also a factor in this as well. And um, Homestead, um, where there's these two people in a nursing home under the ADA, they wanted to choose their own services, and they had the right to do it, um, mentioned in 2019. So, um, there's, uh, and one of the other issues is internalized ableism, where somebody may feel, oh, I'm not as able as the next person, um, because of the fact that, um, I can't do this that other people can do. And people say, well, oh, does that make me, and a lot of men say, well, does that make me less of a man? Because around men could be uh, strong, and yet for somebody who's physically disabled, they may not be able to, or somebody who's disabled may not be able to, uh, may have trouble with muscle mass. So that's an issue as well. Um, fear. So, for instance, when I was presenting as male, if I had an anxiety issue, people would turn a blind eye. But now that I present as female, people, um, I, I had the cops called on me. So, it's a different, there's a different, uh, issue there. Uh, strength uh, is a huge uh, factor in this too. Again, we have the example of, you know, if the ideal man in people's minds is socially constructed as somebody who has a lot of muscle, physically strong, for people who don't have as much muscle, who are perhaps disabled and have trouble building muscle for whatever reason, uh, they might, um, feel different. Also, it's an issue of identity. So, there's this idea, oh, and another issue with fear is this idea, well, a man shouldn't be afraid. Um, but in reality, for somebody who's disabled, a lot of autistic people are phobic of many things, and a lot of people who identify as male and assign male birth experience anxiety, and that is a huge issue. Um, and they say, well, wait a minute, if I can't feel fear, then if I can't say that 
uh, it's an issue of me emotional, and that's a problem as well. So, um, the next issue is, um, um, and it's an issue of identity because somebody identifies as disabled. Being disabled is a problem. Jim Sinclair once talked about the idea of you can't separate the autism from the person. The person is an autistic person. Um, we think about the issue of uh, pride. Pride is uh, a huge issue. So think about, uh, if we think about disability pride, somebody being proud of the things that they can do and acknowledging the things that they can't do. They're proud of the way they navigate the world. Hence, that is an issue of pride. Also, some people like to portray themselves as they're more able than they actually are because they have so much pride in what they can do, they're afraid to acknowledge their shortcomings because of how other people must them. The media. The media um, has a way of portraying disabled men, uh, disabled people in general, as what Stelly and inspiration point. Pity, praise, token, honor. Um, and uh, inspiration. Now, the reason why that this is relevant is because when um, the media has a lot to do with helping the trade. So a lot of people, for instance, they meet me, I was identified as Asperger's, hence I'm autistic. Um, and they say, well, oh, aren't you like Rayman? Well, not all autistic people are like Rayman. The autistic community is very diverse. So, yeah, there's an issue of, um, so, Again, we have the issue of the emotional. Disabled men feel that they are uh, disabled. Men sometimes, sometimes people who are uh, they all feel like they can't be emotional. Things of that nature that makes them feel weak. Hence, we have the example of somebody who's disabled. Okay, so next issue is privilege. People say, well, somebody who identifies as male transitions to female is giving up privilege. Well, that might be true of non-disabled people, but from what I've noticed, people don't really care that I'm transgender. I'm not treated any differently just because I'm trans. So it doesn't help me much, no more taken seriously than I was before. So that's an issue as well. Another issue is um, child porn. Um, unfortunately, child pornography is a huge issue in the autism community. Uh, if we think of, there was an article by Temple Grandin's mother saying that all autistic men are pedophiles. That's not true, but um, a lot of times when somebody is perhaps intellectually disabled, when somebody is intellectually disabled, they might have what's called an intransion. So a person may hit puberty, but still be watching and developmentally they might be to the point of five-year-old. And they might be attracted to someone on a five-year-old TV show. So they might find people who look like that and have that level of maturity that they have, which is all well and good. And then sometimes what happens is they're online and then they get caught in, uh, they get caught in uh, chat rooms, online chat rooms by cops because they're looking at child pornography, but they don't know. And so that's an issue as well. Another issue is entitlement. Sometimes disabled men, uh, sometimes people who are dying of Asperger's, they say, well, oh, I'm attracted to this person. 
and because it's considered to be manly to engage in sexual activity, they'll be like, oh, I can just touch a girl's butt whenever I want to. Well, there's no reasonable foundation for that. So that's an issue as well. Another issue is uh, public health, public health issues in regards to masculinity. Um, think about police brutality. Um, you know, shooting unarmed um, black men and thinking that they have guns or that they're dangerous just because they're black, that's an issue. Um, we think about the war on drugs. Um, the war on drugs is a huge issue because there are so many people, particularly um, men, who the media portrays as dangerous and they sometimes um, get caught a little level offensive, marijuana, so on and so forth, so on drugs, as opposed to helping them, uh, they end up going to jail where they get education on how to be a criminal by other criminals. Another issue is uh, another issue is restraint. Restraining people is a huge issue. Um, I went to a school where a lot of people got restrained. Now, restraining people is very controversial. Because um, somebody who is restrained, they, somebody who's restrained, uh, sometimes people have died in restraints. I, I've seen a lot of people have accidents during restraints. And restraining people is a safe last resort. Sometimes it's overused and sometimes people do get hurt. However, I don't know if I have to call my community, so I guess restraining people might be in some other way because whether circumstances lesser of the two evils. Uh, prisons are a huge issue. We take like the school prison pipeline where kids are uh, disciplined in school for drugs or whatever, and then that deal with security, sometimes they're handcuffed, and then they have to take, um, they have to take, uh, then they go to a judge, and then they get to prison. Now, sometimes, uh, sometimes the judge is paid off by the prison, the prison is privately run, so on and so forth. Okay. Uh, another issue in prisons is solitary confinement. Um, in some marginalized cases, uh, it can be used to protect someone who's considered to be in a vulnerable position. A lot of disabled people and transgender people end up in this position. So, uh, in the trans community, one of the biggest fears is you never want to end up in prison because there's a high likelihood that you might die. Um, so there are a lot of people who are put in solitary environment to protect them. I think that's for the disabled. There was an individual in New Jersey who was in a group home. And in a group home, and he was aggressive, he struggled with aggression. And then he was, uh, they couldn't house him in the group home, he was thrown out of three of them. And before he could be sent to another one, he had to go to uh, go to jail because that was the only place that could hold him. So that's an issue as well. Another issue uh, that coincides with that is somebody who is placed in prison automatically qualifies for Medicaid. So it can also be used to help people get services. Another issue, public health, is um, mass shootings where um, people's marginalization is uh, gets to the point where 
the only way, and this is an issue when it comes to masculinity, because we say that men can't be emotional, men can't do this, men uh, can't feel this way, uh, because of that, and it's not, um, or that way. A lot of people said, well, nothing I do, nobody's recognizing my isolation, my marginalization, my lack of connection, and then they say, well, the only option is I have to go somewhere and shoot a lot of people out of my anger, my frustration. And that's an issue as well. Next issue, people are angry. When somebody's marginalized and feels unrecognized, it leads to a lot of anger and resentment. So that is an issue as well. Oftentimes, People are so hopeless. The only place they feel they can turn a lot of working class whites particularly feel like they have to take their marginalization and hate the others. So they join hate groups. Because the hate group tells them, Oh, there's no community for you, but we are here to support you based upon hating the other. And that's an issue as well. Another issue is uh, queer health care. Um, so an issue could be uh, the first, and that's a big issue as well. And so if we think of um, coming out, somebody who's coming out as disabled, right? somebody who's coming out um, as LGBT, might LGBTQIA clause who is uh, coming out uh, might uh, feel a lot of um, connection and pushback. Some people are excommunicated from their families. Uh, also, the passing and lack of authenticity of being so called in the closet lead to a lot of distress and discomfort as well. Um, another issue is PrEP. So PrEP is an issue um, because um, PrEP is a drug used to help with um, SCI complete HIV. To treat. Um, and PEP is used as a looking uh, after pill as well. Um, so that's uh, a lot of uh, gay men have to um, take it um, as well as a critical matter, but also it's a huge issue of testing in the queer community as well, particularly among uh, gay men. Historically, in the 80s, there were a lot of uh, gay men who were afraid of the stigma of getting tested for AIDS, hence the AIDS epidemic. Um, another issue is um, cis gay men. Cis gay men is a huge issue as well. Historically, they have been told, um, historically, the queer community has been controlled by cis gay men, people who were assigned male and attracted to other men. This was an issue of, um, an issue of this was an issue for Sylvia Rivera, trans activist, one time at one uh, rally for uh, LGBT rights. She said, well, okay, I, as a, dis as a trans woman, have given so much to this movement, and yet you don't acknowledge the trans people within the context of uh, the gay rights movement, 
what about the sacrifices we made for your well-being? So that was an issue as well. We think about this in the context of at Stonewall, Russia P. Darrington was show, throwing the first brick, things of that nature. Um, another issue is uh, homophobia. Uh, in a lot of places, people are killed for being gay, and some places, even in the United States, have anti-sodomy laws on the books as well. And uh, historically, um, being gay used to be in the DSM, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Disabilities. Um, trans women. Trans women are a huge issue as well. A lot of times when it comes to trans women, they are uh, oftentimes when uh, they go and they date a guy, the guy finds out that they're trans, um, they might feel betrayed, um, feel gypped, and the cis guy might retaliate and a lot of trans people get uh, murdered that way. I just the Day of Remembrance every November the first day get together and most the loss of transgender people that we have lost. Um, uh, also, it's an uh, issue as well of uh, the portrayal of trans men. I, I train, the portrayal of trans men. So people can say, well, that means that you're gay or something. Uh, it doesn't. Transgender people are born on mutations. Um, but that's an issue as well. And uh, the way trans women are perceived um, by cis men, it's an issue as well. Uh, okay. Another issue is uh, transphobia. We think about this in the context of, um, you know, anti-bathroom bills, things of that nature, where a person who identifies in a certain way can't use the bathroom in which they identify with anymore, the pushback they get thereof. Um, Another issue is uh, T, uh, testosterone, um, trans. Men um, take testosterone to masculinize their body. And send you through a pseudo um, male puberty of sorts. And for those who take um, testosterone, uh, it's a huge issue. There was this one issue in Arizona, this one individual, an autistic trans guy who was told that or autism had to be cured before they could start testosterone in turn the person committed to by time. And uh, the next issue is binding. Um, we think about um, men historically having a flat chest. Although some people who take certain medications, cis men, do grow less, um, let's say with steroid, and some trans men, trans men who are what's called pre-op, um, have not had top surgery. They still have breasts from their first puberty, um, if they're transition, which most of the time it is post-puberty. There's no more trans kids, but that's an issue as well. Um, and one of the things that, um, because if you think about it, we allow men in society to take off their shirts and uh, show their chest, chest hair, things of that nature. A lot of trans men, uh, they need a flat chest and they're 
the grass was a lot of dysphoria, so what they might do for that, um, a very common thing is uh, they might find where they might take some sort of compression. There's a lot of different ways to do it, but they basically essentially compress the rest of their body, trying to make it seem like they have a flat chest. Okay, top surgery. So, um, so there are different types, but basically the idea is to masculinize the chest so it is flatter and in turn progress. So that is natural as well. Moving the breasts. That is. Um, Breast tissue, so their chest is flat, um, and that's a huge issue as well because some have argued that there's a lot of gatekeeping. Uh, in order to get any transform surgery, you need two letters from um, one provider who you've been working with, so if they say it's all right of that nature, and one. So that's the issue as well. Um, bottom surgery. Bottom surgery is a huge, huge issue. If you think about the issue of masculinity, there's a lot of association with masculinity and the idea of a penis. Uh, when I was growing up, a lot of the men that I was growing up with used to have arguments about their penis and eyes, make jokes about their penis, and make jokes about how big their dick was, and so on and so forth. And the way people who are socialized know their sexuality is very centered around the penis area. It's like, well, Sexuality is based on who gets you hurt. You know, that's how it was talked about when I was growing up. Hence, I was socialized male, that's why I had that experience. Not all men are born with penises. Some people lose their penises in accidents, it happens. Uh, so, the idea of bottom surgery is to construct a penis on um, a trans. Not binary now. Uh, yeah. Uh, there's an issue. Uh, another issue is uh, packing. Somebody who's trans masculine, also drag teams do this too, they take their. Uh, they feel more comfortable having a bulge in between their legs, and it makes them dysphoric that they don't have. So, some people, what they do is they get what people might use as uh, a uh, strap-on and they might wear it to create the appearance of a bulge. Some people might, who can't afford a strap-on or don't have one or can't get one for whatever reason, might use socks. There are various different ways to pack. It varies, but within uh, the trans masculine side of the spectrum, it's very common uh, that people do it. Um, uh, another issue related to that is STPs. Um, a lot of trans men feel um, uh, really find it um, identity affirming to use a urinal. So they would take essentially a plastic penis and use that to help direct their urine from their vagina into the urine. So that's something uh, as well that's related to that because um, 
uh, in society we think of men urinating standing up, but some men urinate sitting down, some men urinate standing up, some women um, urinate standing up. It really depends, and some women uh, sit down. Now, when it comes to gender, some women have penises, some guys have a It really varies again, like these things are on the spectrum. So, um, the next issue is uh, pregnancy. Um, pregnancy uh, is an issue. We normally think of uh, um, conventional wisdom says men can't get pregnant. Well, there are some men who can get pregnant. Uh, there are uh, same men on uh, trans mass shootings where optimization gets to the point where the only way, and this is an issue when it comes to mentality, because we say that men can't be emotional, men can't do this, men uh, can't feel this way uh, because of that, and it's not. Um, or that way. A lot of people said, well, the thing I do, nobody's recognizing my isolation, my marginalization, my lack of connection. The only option is I have to go somewhere and shoot a lot of people at my anger, my frustration. And that's an issue as well. Next issue, angry. When somebody's marginalized and feels unrecognized, it leads to a lot of anger and resentment. So that is an issue. Well, oftentimes people are so hopeless. The only place they feel they turn a lot of working class whites, particularly, feel like they have to take their marginalization and hate the others. So they join hate groups because the hate group tells them, "Oh, there's no community for you, but we are here to support you," based upon hating the other. And that's true is uh, queer health care. Um, so an issue could be uh, the first, and that's a big issue as well. And so if we think of um, coming out, somebody who's coming out, somebody who's coming out um, as LGBT, might LGBTQIA, Clause who it is uh, coming out uh, might uh, feel a lot of um, connection and pushback. Some people are excommunicated from their families. Uh, also, the passing and lack of authenticity of being so called in the closet can lead to a lot of distress and discomfort as well. It's prep. So, Trip is an issue um, because um, prep is a drug used to help with um, STI, particularly HIV, used to treat. Um, and prep is used as a uh, after pill as well. Um, so that's uh, a lot of uh, gay men have to um, take it um, as well as a friend from another, but also it's a huge issue of testing in the clerk community as well, particularly among uh, gay men. Uh, historically in the 80s, there were a lot of uh, gay men who were afraid of the stigma of getting tested for AIDS, hence the AIDS epidemic. Um, another issue is um, cis gay men. Cis gay men is a huge issue as well. Historically, they have been told, um, historically, the queer community has been controlled by cis gay men who were assigned male friends and attracted to other men. This was an issue of um, an issue an 
into an entry for Sylvia Rivera. Transacted this one time at one uh, rally for uh, LGBT rights. She said, well, okay, I, as a this, as a trans woman, have given so much to this movement, and yet you don't acknowledge the trans people within the context of uh, the gay rights movement. What about the sacrifices we made for your equality? So that was an issue as well. We think about this in the context of at Stonewall, Russia P. Darrington was show, throwing the first brick of that nature. Um, another issue is uh, homophobia. Uh, in a lot of places people are killed for being gay and some places even in the United States have anti-sodomy laws on the books as well. And uh, historically um, being gay used to be in the DSM, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Disabilities. Um, trans women. Trans women are a huge issue as well. A lot of times when it comes to trans women, they are uh, oftentimes when uh, they go and they date a guy, the guy finds out that they're trans, um, they might feel betrayed, um, feel gypped, and the cis guy might retaliate, and a lot of trans people get uh, murdered that way. Um, I just gave remembrance every November, the friends can get together and mourn the loss. Transgender people that we have lost. Um, also, it's an uh, issue as well uh, the portrayal of trans men. I, I train, the portrayal of trans women. So people can say, well, that means that you're gay or something. Uh, it doesn't. Transgender people are born. Um, but that's an issue as well, and uh, the way trans women are perceived um, by cis men, it's an issue as well. Uh, okay, another issue is uh, transphobia. We think about this in the context of, um, you know, anti-bathroom bills, things of that nature, where a person who identifies in a certain way can't use the bathroom in which they identify with, or the pushback they get thereof. Um, another issue is uh, T, uh, testosterone. Um, trans men to masculinize their body. Hence, then you grew a pseudo um, male puberty of sorts. And for those who take uh, testosterone, uh, it's a huge issue. There was this one issue in Arizona, this one individual, an autistic trans guy, who was told that her autism had to be cured before they could start testosterone and turn the person into that. And uh, the next issue is binding. Um, we think about um, men historically having a flat chest. Although some people who take certain medications, cis men, do grow less. Um, let's say the sterile, and some trans men, trans men who are what's called pre-op, um, have not had top surgery. They still have breasts from their 
post puberty, um, if they're transitioning, which most of the time it ends post puberty, there's no more trans kids, but that's an issue as well. Um, and one of the things that, um, because if you think about it, we allow men in society to take off their shirts and uh, show their chest, chest hair, things of that nature. A lot of trans men, uh, they need a flat chest and their, their breast has a lot of dysphoria. So what they might do for that, um, a very common thing is uh, they might find it where they might take some sort of compression. There's a lot of different ways to do it, but they basically essentially compress the rest of their body, trying to make it seem like they have a flat chest. Okay. Top surgery. So, um, so there are different types, but basically the idea is to maximize the chest hair and splatter and in turn the breasts. Well. Moving the breast. That is um, uh, moving breast tissue so their chest is flat. That's a huge issue as well because some have argued that there's a lot of gatekeeping. Uh, in order to get any transform surgery, you need two letters from uh, one provider who you've been working with. So if they say, and all threads of that nature in one uh, that you just met. So that's the nature of the uh, surgery. Bottom surgery is a huge, huge issue. If you think about the issue of masculinity, there's a lot of association with masculinity and the idea of a penis. Uh, when I was growing up, a lot of the men that I was growing up with, used to have arguments about their penis and eyes, make jokes about their penis, and make jokes about what dick was, and so on and so forth. Hey, people who are socialized male, their sexuality is very centered around the penis area. It's like, well, sexuality is something that you heard. That's how I was talked about when I was growing up. Hence, I'm a socialized male, that's why I had that experience. And I'm born with penises. Some people lose their penises in accidents, it happens. Uh, so, the idea of bottom surgery is to construct a penis on um, a trans and non binary male. There's an issue, uh, another issue is uh, packing. Somebody who's transmasculine, also drag teams do this too, they take their, uh, they feel more comfortable having a bulge in between their legs, and it makes them just work, but they don't have to. So some people, what they do is they get what people might use as uh, a uh, strap-on, and they might wear it to create the appearance of a bulge. Some people might, who can't afford a strap on or don't have one or can't get one for whatever reason, might use socks. There are various different ways to pack. It varies, but within uh, the trans masculine side of the spectrum, it's very common uh, that people do it. Um, uh, another issue related to that is STPs. Um, a lot of trans men feel um, uh, really find it um, identity affirming to use a urinal. So they would take essentially a plastic penis and use that help direct their urine from their vagina into the earth. So that's something uh, uh, as well that's related to that because uh, in society we think of men urinating standing up, but some men urinate sitting down, some men urinate standing up, some women um, urinate standing up. 
it really depends in seven women uh, take down. Women have to be so that's not the difference. It really grinds the gamut. These things are on the spectrum. So, um, the next issue is uh, pregnancy. Um, pregnancy uh, is an issue. We normally think of uh, um, conventional wisdom says men can't get pregnant. Well, there are some men who can get pregnant. Uh, they're uh, same men on T. People are, associate that with not being able to get pregnant because oftentimes the period stops. But in reality, oftentimes, um, sometimes trans men get pregnant. And one of the issues is. Um, when a, somebody who's trans masculine gets pregnant is, um, uh, somebody who's trans masculine, uh, gets pregnant, oftentimes, uh, society uh, doesn't know, and they're considered to be a phenomenon, and they're tokenized, sometimes insurances won't cover pregnancy, um, for men. So sometimes they have to re-identify themselves back as female, and then that causes a lot of trauma because they don't identify that way with a lot of dysphoria. So that is an issue as well. And this has been a presentation on masculinity and society.